Pastor Nan. Hello, today's message is, to whom shall we go? To whom shall we go? Luke chapter 9, verse 59, and it states this. To another, he said, follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, leave the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Yet another said, I will follow you, Lord, but let me first say farewell to those at my home. And Jesus said to him, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Let's pray. Lord God, as we look at your word, may you bring clarity to our souls. That it is an invitation for us to come. It is an invitation to truly see and to know what occurs when we earnestly and honestly discover who you are. And we pray that you would begin to transform our church, that your word, Lord God, would go forth, and that the soils of these hearts would be ready and good to receive, that deep roots would take place, that their lives would be beginning to be transformed. And so we thank you for all that you do, all that you will continue to do in our church, and we pray all of this. In your name. Amen. If you look at this text, it's a little bit weird because something occurs, and you know, as we're looking at all the gospels and how Jesus interacts with the people who want to follow him. This is the thing that God is showing us through all his relationships and encounters with people. Is that when Jesus initially meets with people, they delight in wanting to follow him. When you hear about all the people who've met up Jesus across history from those that don't believe in Him, those who pursue other religions, it doesn't matter, but they like Jesus. On the initial first findings, they love what He says. They love who He is. They love how He reaches the broken, and they love the truth that He speaks. So everyone is happy to say that, yeah, I'll follow Jesus. How many of us are willing to say, I want to follow Him? And so many people say, Jesus is the person that we want to follow. And, and the thing is, as we're growing up and as we're sinning, as we're falling away, whatever is happening in our life, following Jesus is not the problem. Saying that we want to follow Jesus is not the problem. Because what Jesus says to all of us is, follow me. It is an open invitation to every single one of us. He wants you to follow him. But when you respond, then He lets you know if you truly have meant what you said when you said, I will follow. And so Jesus says, follow me. And three people encounter and three people say that they will. But they also say, let me do something. The first person says, Lord, let me first go and bury my father in the word of God. It dictates that they should, that they should love their family, and especially in this culture, that they should go and bury the father that gave birth to them, that raised them. And so it is no more for that to happen. And so when Jesus hears that, it should be just a normal thing. And then Jesus says, leave the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. And so it seems like Jesus was saying, don't do what the rest of scriptures have said. But that's not what he meant. In verse 62, it says, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. And so for all three accounts, it seems as if Jesus is saying, this is required of you. When you say you want to follow me. But we have to come to understand that it is a difficult saying. And it is something that we shouldn't easily say, yes, I will follow him. But Jesus wants to bring clarity to your heart. Do you mean what you say? 
When you have grown up in the youth group and you've heard the message, if you accept Christ as your Lord and Savior, He died for you on the cross, shed His blood, and He gave all that He had. Who's not going to want that? Are you a sinner and everyone's going to say yes? I have sinned and I continue to sin, so I need Jesus. And so when He says, follow me, our answer naturally is, of course. Why wouldn't we? But Jesus, what he said to these people after they said, I will follow you. This is the thing that we have to wrestle with. For many of us, we think the battle is getting to a state where we want to say to Jesus, I want to follow you. But what Jesus is saying is that when you tell me that you want to follow me, the questions that I bring up in your heart after, that is the question I need you to seriously think through. Because many of us, we will come to church and we will say those words, I will follow you. But you have to be awake and ready to hear what Jesus says after. Knowing that it was impossible for some, Jesus tells them one of the most difficult things for many of them in that culture. But before we can fully comprehend what Jesus is saying, we have to look at an Old Testament verse to figure out what he meant by this weird phrase. He said, when you put your hand on the plow, don't look back. Those people are not ready for the kingdom of God. And so let's look at 1 Kings chapter 19. And if we look at 1 Kings chapter 19, I think it'll show us what it means. What is this whole plow? If you have your plow and your hand is on it, that probably means you're ready to plow, you're ready to work, you're ready to do the things. But if you look back, you're not ready. And even though you say the words, I want to follow Christ, you may not be ready. 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 19 says this. So he departed from there, and this is Elijah, and found Elisha, the son of Shaphat, who was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen in front of him. Imagine like rows and rows of cows, right, oxen, like bulls, and they're all walking and they're yoked together and there's a huge plow. And every plow has somebody who needs, this is not like, you know, John Deere where, you know, one machine does all the work, but you need rows and rows and rows of cows and people holding these heavy metal things to like plow the land and every fertile soil that needs to be made so that plants can grow. So imagine like rows of these cows on yoke and each person holding and a Elijah shows up and he goes to one person. And he was with the twelve. And so Elisha, this is two different names, Elisha and Elijah. Elijah, okay, Elijah, we'll call him an Elias, we'll call the other one, right? And Elijah shows up and says to Elisha, he puts his cloak upon him and then he walks away. So Elisha is plowing, holding the cow, all of a sudden he gets a cloak. And in verse 20 it says, And he left the oxen and ran after Elijah and said, Let me kiss my father and my mother and then I will follow you. Doesn't it sound exactly like what Jesus' people, the ones who said they'll follow, was saying? And he said to him, Go back again, for what have I done to you? And so Elijah basically says, Go. Am I requiring anything of you? All I did was put on the clothes. Do whatever you want to do. And so he turns back. And in verse 21 it says, And he returned from following him and took the yoke of oxen and sacrificed them and boiled their flesh with the yokes of oxen and gave it to the people and they ate. Then he arose and went after Elijah and assisted him. This is a weird thing that you read in the Bible. Some dude is plowing the oxen. This prophet shows up, puts on a cloak, and all of a sudden goes, hey, let me do something. I want to say goodbye. And then he goes back, and then all of a sudden, to say goodbye, he takes the yoke, he takes the plow, he destroys it, he makes a fire, then he boils the, all the oxen that he was using, and then he gives it to all the people. And then he turns around and he goes. Jesus was referring to what he was trying to get the people to see when they said, so easily, I will follow you. To say the words to Christ, I will follow you, is easy when you know that the alternative is hell. 
You know that following Christ, receiving Him, accepting Him, and all His love for you, when you're broken, when you're sad, you feel like no one loves you, when Jesus comes and He invites you and says, I love you, my love is infinite, infinite, and I will never abandon you, and I will never forsake you, it's easy for us to say, then I will follow you. But Jesus comes and He says, let me show you what that is that you are trying to say to me. And if you truly mean it, and what we see in this picture, what Jesus was referring to is this. When Elisha received his calling and the cloak came, he went back to the cow and the yoke and the life that he had. He was a faithful son who worked for his dad and he worked and worked and he was trying to be faithful to his family. And when God's calling became heavy and he knew that God was building him up and he was waiting because you know that because when the cloak came, he knew exactly what that calling was and what God had spoken to him. But until the very moment of this calling, he was faithful to his family to work and he worked hard. But when the calling came, he laid down the yoke. He destroyed it, he put it on fire, and then he cooked the cows. Steak, right? Steak party on his last day. And he gives it to all the people. And then he turns around and he leaves. And then what, what it says is this. When the people who told Jesus, let me go bury my father, let me do this, let me do that, for all of them, they had something that was more important than Christ. They had something that they needed to do, that the responsibilities and all the family and everything in their life, those things that were important, and Jesus knew it, and so he said, this is where your heart really is. For Elisha, this is the opposite. And even though it sounded the same, he went back, he killed a cow, and he killed the yoke, and he destroyed the plow, and what he meant by that was that I will never come back to this life. That's all that he was. He was faithful as a son. He was faithful as a family. He was faithful. And yet in his heart, when he received the calling to follow and do the will of God, he put all of that aside. And he said, I will not put anything before God. And so he put all of that aside. And his family knew that when he said goodbye, that that was it. And so he turned around and he followed and so his calling, he knew, meant the surrender of all that he was to now receive all that he will do for the kingdom of God. You see, it's a new life. It is not a means to make your life better. Christianity and religion and other religions may make you happier or better or try harder, be nicer to your family, be good, and maybe God will have favor and maybe things will go your way. Maybe you'll get a job, maybe you'll get a smile, maybe you'll get married, and this is the way that we approach religion. But Jesus was saying was what he was saying was this. Are you following me because of some benefit you think you will receive? But let me tell you this. When you follow me, it is a surrender of all that you are. And are you ready to lay down all that you built up, all that you thought religion was, all that you think everything in your life you wanted to do? Are you ready to lay it all down and let me re define for your life where you will go, what you will do? Are you ready to place everything in your life upon the altar and say, what is it that you want to win? When you hear this, it's going to be very easy for you to hear the wrong message. Okay, listen carefully. Many of you are like, Put that Many of you are going to just hear this beginning part and you're going to be like, Pastor Bobby, I don't want to serve. This is exactly, I knew it. Religion and it's going to make me give up stuff and I have to give up my job. I have to give up my boyfriend and I have to give up my girlfriend and I have to give up my life. I can't be rich. I can't do this. And I'm just going to be in some foreign country eating cockroaches and telling people about Jesus. I knew it. Religion is terrible. You're going to demand this of me. And I'm like, no. It's an invitation. It is not one of guilt. It's not one of shame. That's why Elijah, when he comes and Elijah says, let me go back. Let me say goodbye to my family. He says, what does that have to do with me? I'm not demanding that you give up this or destroy your yoke. I'm not telling you to be super Christian. I'm not telling you to leave everything behind. What I'm telling you is this. God told me that you have a calling and I have given you that. 
that message. But it is up to you to figure out what that means. Are you truly a follower of God or not? That is not up for me to decide. That is not up for you to make me feel like you are doing the right thing. It has nothing to do with me, so I walk away. And what happened to Elisha is this. There was no requirement. He didn't have to destroy all of that. In his heart, in his soul, what he was saying was, I laid down my old life. My old life was full of piety and living for people and doing things in this righteous way and doing all that. And what I'm saying is that old life where I'm trying to be good, I lay it all down. For I allow God now in my full surrender to decide where I go, what I do, who I am with, and how I will live. What it's saying is this. You do not surrender your life to be saved. When you are saved, you surrender your life. You do not, in your will and power, because me saying this message for you understood it, and so now you're like, I'm not going to be a doctor anymore. I'm not going to be a dentist or a lawyer. I'm not going to do this and that. And I'm not going to hang out with my family and I'm going to break up with my girl. That's not it. It's not for me to tell you what you do with your life. It's not for me to tell you what it means to be religious. What it's saying is this. When you come to understand the cross and how Christ has given all, and there is no requirement for you to be saved because He has done it all. And when you fall in love with Him, you surrender all that you are to Him. Not because it's required, but because that life, all your sin, and all the things that you have ever dreamt of, it is nothing compared to the love you have received. And so you lay it at the feet of Christ. When you are in love with Him, you lay your life and you say, do whatever you want with it. If it means being a doctor, if it means being a lawyer, if it means anything you want me to be, whoever you want me to be, it doesn't matter. If you want me to continue with the same path that you want, you see what the message is when you are in love with Christ, you surrender it. It could be the exact same thing for the rest of your life, and yet your heart attitude has now changed. It is not now you deciding what to do. It is now saying, do you want me to go the same way? Then it is yours. Do you want me to go to a different path? Then it is yours. Do you want me to stay here forever? Then it is yours. Now it's an attitude that you are fully and finally for the first time in your life fully satisfied in God alone. You're not looking for anything else or anyone else or a house, a home, a car, a job, nothing to define you because you are fully satisfied. And so you say, tell me what you want. If it's the same, then I will do the same. You see? You don't surrender to gain salvation. You gain salvation and then you surrender. Most of us will get this confused. And when you get this confused, all of Christianity feels heavy and the yoke is too much of a burden. Because it becomes about what kind of clothes you have to wear, where you cannot go, what you cannot drink, what you cannot be seen smoking or doing, or all sorts of other things. And in your heart, you're like, I'm not ready to serve God. I'm not ready. I just want to watch Korean dramas all summer, and I don't want to be homeless people. I don't want to do anything. I just want to be by myself. So I'm not ready to follow Christ. So I'm not ready to surrender all these things that I want to do. And so I'm not going to follow Him. You see in your heart what you're saying is that surrendering makes you closer to Christ. When the Bible says, when you are closer to Christ, you just surrender. When you get it wrong, it becomes a burden. But when you get it right, you rejoice at every opportunity to see Him alive. What He was asking the people when they said they will follow Him is this, do you understand what you're saying? Do you understand that when you say you want to follow me, that in your heart you have made religion something you do. You add it onto your life. You go to church and you serve and you get titles and it's about you and what
what you do, but let me tell you, it's about a relationship that transforms you so fundamentally that destroying whatever it is and saying that I will never come back. And the power and the guilt and all of this, I can surrender all that I am in the past because I have gained all that I need. Let me show you in John chapter 6 what happens to the disciples. John chapter 6, verse 60 says, When many of the disciples heard it, they said, This is a hard thing, because this is what happened. All these thousands of people were like, I want to follow Jesus. And then Jesus turned around and goes, You have to eat my flesh and drink my blood. And everyone was like, What the name? Right? To you and I, you hear this all the time because I say it to you. That is the bread, that is the flesh, that is the blood. And you're like, Yeah, that's normal. Drinking flesh? You know, I mean, drinking blood and eating flesh? Huh? Good stuff. We do it every other month. It's delicious and it's good. And you guys are all okay with it. Back then, nobody talked about eating other people's flesh. Nobody talked about drinking blood. And so when Jesus turned around and says, Hey, you want to follow me? Eat my flesh and drink my blood. They were all like, Oh, gross. Because they took it literally. They were like, What? That doesn't even make sense. Are we following a crazy man? This person who they were following And they freaked out. And so they say, how can we listen to this stuff? But Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples were grumbling about this, said to them, do you take offense at this? Then what if you were to see the Son of God ascending to where he was before? Basically what he was saying was, are you going to get discouraged and leave me if I leave you? What if I leave you? What if you're following me because I'm close and I can heal people and I can make you see that I am God? What if you see all of this? What if I leave? Will you then walk away? What if it's not sweet? What if you're not crying? What if your friends don't want to go to church? Are you going to leave me? And so everything Jesus is asking is, are you and I real? Or are you doing it because everyone else? In verse 64, it says, But there are some of you who do not believe, for Jesus knew from the beginning who those were who did not believe and who it was who would betray him. All the people who told him that I'll follow you, he knew. He knew which ones were just saying it and which ones would take the cost and surrender all. And in verse 65, he said, This is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted by him, to him by the Father. And in verse 66, this is one of the saddest passages in the Bible. When I read this, I was like, oh man. After this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. Everybody was like, I want to follow you. I'm excited about Jesus. Jesus says, eat my flesh, drink my blood. And they're all like, ew. And they all walked away. And he was once again left with the twelve. And in verse 67, he looks at them and he says, Do you want to go away as well? All the people all across the churches of America, they write books because they write things like how to build a mega church. Pastors are actually required, some churches, to read those readings. How to build a church where everybody wants to come and everyone is happy. Buy a Starbucks. Get a franchise. People can drink coffee in the church so they don't have to go outside of the church so they'll stay in. But if you look at the way that Jesus did ministry, everyone wanted to follow him. He would say something weird and everyone left. Jesus is the worst church planner in the world. He destroyed every chance of making people stay because he would ask them tough questions. And even to the ones that were closest, he looked at them in the eye and he said, do you also want to leave? And Simon Peter, who always gets things wrong most of the time, he answers so correct in this passage. In verse 68, Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom 
shall we go. You have the words of eternal life. And this was the same thing that Elisha said. Where else are we going to go to find life? He said, go back. Are you going to leave me like the rest of the people? And he was like, I can go back to my house. I can go back and be a fisherman. I can even try to be rich and I can even try to get an education. I can do whatever I want and I can go and be happy. But he said, where am I going to go where there is the word of very life that has transformed me from someone who had a religion to now I'm a new creation? There is nothing else in this world that I can turn around and go back to. And the question that Jesus asked and that I want to ask of you, our church, is this. If Jesus were to ask you, are you going to walk away from me? Do you have something that you always turn back to? Or will you look at Jesus and say, where am I going to go? You're my everything. I would venture to guess that there is very few of us here who would say, there is nowhere else for me to go. You have all of my heart. And I have no delight in anything else. Where would my soul find rest? ever again. You see, Jesus' questions always brought clarity and it always brought people to understand where they truly are. Because many times our words will be different than where our hearts are. Because our words will say, we love you, we'll follow you. And our hearts will say, but I love everything else more than you. And so Jesus brings clarity and he says, don't just tell me your words. But when you say the words, I will follow you. Will your response to me be, where am I going to go? Where am I going to go? You have the only words of eternal life. You do not abandon everything you love to be saved by God. You come to know that you are saved because there is absolutely no value in anything apart from Christ. Jesus was saying, if you want to love your family, love me first, and then you will truly be able to love your family. Jesus didn't say give up your family so that I know that you love me. What he meant was, if I am not central, then you will never be fulfilled in a relationship. You will never be fulfilled in a job or a family or a title. You don't surrender your life. And you don't surrender things to have me. But when you have me, you give all. So that I can redefine them. And to finish, I'm going to give you some quotes by people who discovered this. A.W. Tozer is one of my favorite people. It's like crazy. He was very uneducated. He didn't know how to write or speak. But he was like, you know what? I need to read the Bible. So he was like, God, teach me. So he just, that's what he did. Okay? And then he looked at Shakespeare and he was like, I can't understand this gibberish. God, give me wisdom. So he prayed and prayed, and he kept reading, and then one day he said, it just became clear. And I was like, dang. We need more of that. A.W. Tozer, if you read his writings, it is sometimes one of the most difficult readings. I remember I gave a book for someone to read, and they're like, I don't understand this. He's like, every sentence, I have to spend 10 minutes like reading each word and being like, oh. And I was like, yeah. Those are the good readings, heavy. He said this, people who are crucified with Christ have three distinct marks. Number one, they are only facing one direction, to the saviors. Number two, they can never turn back. Where am I gonna go? You 
are all my joy. And number three, they no longer have plans of their own. Not because they're not the same or whatever, but because they're no longer His plans. They're no longer their plans. It is His plan. You see? Different. One of the most sweetest people, and maybe some of her theology wasn't all that correct, but one of the people that I do cherish the most in the way that she loved everyone is Mother Teresa, and she said this. Following Jesus is simple. And to her, it really was. But not easy. You love until it hurts. And then you love more. Following Jesus is easy. And secondly, she said, I like this. I am just a little pencil in God's hand. And with me, he is writing a love letter to the world. Right? You're a pencil. And you're a love letter from God to the rest of the world. And A.W. Tozer finally and one of his quotes says this. The true follower of Christ will not ask if I embrace its truth, what will it cost me? Rather, he will say, this is truth. God, help me to walk in it and let come whatever may. It's not about sacrifice. It's only about one sacrifice that was done on the cross 2,000 years ago. He doesn't need you to sacrifice to give you life. He needs you to know that love so that sacrifice is no longer one. Let's pray. I think you and I have gotten everything wrong. We have attended church all our lives. And in our hearts we've decided that giving and doing pleases God. But it doesn't. Because whatever you give or love will never be perfect enough. But he says, my son did it all. My son lived perfect. My son gave all. And all I require of you is that you know that. You know that through and through in your soul. That when you tell me that you want to follow me, I need you to know that it can't just be words. It has to be so honest and so real, and you have to be so blown away by His love for you that you can surrender all your fears and all your doubts and all of your future into the hand of a God who was willing to sacrifice his only son. I would not give you all that you need and more that is best for you. He has already shown you the greatest love. This is not a moment of guilt. It is an invitation. The judgment will come when we die or when Christ returns. But today is an invitation from our Savior for you to come home. To delight in His love. To not be scared that you're not good enough. But it's an invitation. You never have to be good enough for His love. Because that's why He loves us. That's why you got it. And so he says, come home, fall in love. And then we'll talk about surrender and all of it later. So I pray that you will fall in love with him today.